download our IELTS preparation app and access unlimited premium practice material for your exam. Part 1 You are going to hear a telephone conversation between a customer and a sales representative about hiring a moving truck. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello, A1 Moving Truck Hire, Gary here. Oh, hello. I I'm moving house and I need to hire a truck. And I just wanted to get some advice from you because I really don't know much about them. OK, well, if you tell me what your needs are, I can prepare a quote for you and send it to you. OK, great. Now, can I just get some contact details from you for the form? Your name is... Meg. Meg Smith. Thank you. Now, what's your address? 15 Neal Street. Is that N-E-I-L or N-E-A-L? A-L. Right. And what's the suburb? Springfield. Got it. And if I can just get a contact telephone number... I'll give you my mobile number. That's probably the best one to use. It's 0487590122. Got it. OK then, Meg. What kind of truck are you interested in? Well, I don't really know. I'm sorry to be so ignorant. <laughs> That's OK. How big is your apartment? Well, there's one bedroom and a living room. My husband and I are moving to a larger place. OK, so it's quite small. Well, I'd probably recommend a five-metre truck. It's suitable for three or more rooms and is our most popular model. That sounds good, but we haven't got a lot of money. I'm looking for the most economical option. OK, then. Well, there's also the four-metre truck. It's better for a studio apartment, but you could probably fit your things in it if you haven't got too much stuff. Well, that one will probably be OK, I think. OK, I'll put that down in the quote. How much is that one, by the way? It's $24 an hour. I see. Well, that's not too bad. I thought it would be at least $30, and I didn't want to pay more than $200 for the day. Does that price include petrol, too? Yes, the truck will have a full tank. But that price doesn't include the deposit. That's $100. But you get that back when you return the truck. Oh, I see. Before you hear the rest of the recording, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, we do offer some additional optional extras. Would you like to hear about them? Sure. Well, you can choose a truck with a tow bar, so you can tow a trailer with additional items. And we also offer trucks with air conditioning. Sounds good. I don't really feel confident about driving with a trailer, but the air conditioning might be good. Yes, it can get pretty hot here. I'll put that down then. Now, you said that you live in Springfield, but where are you moving to? Our new apartment is on the other side of town, in Barkmere. Barkmere? How do you spell that? Oh, it's B 
A R K M E R E. Right. Now we have two branches, so you can pick up your truck from the city centre or the airport, whichever you prefer. Well, the airport is very close to Springfield, so that branch would be better for us. Okay, I'll put that down. You can decide later where you want to drop it off. Now, how long do you need the van for? Well, we're not sure how long it will take. Probably about eight hours. Is that okay? Yeah, that should be fine. Oh, good. Well, thanks very much for all your help. No problem. Oh, before I let you go, can I just run through some insurance details? Oh yes, sure. Now, are you and your husband both planning on driving the truck? Ah,、uh, yes, we might be. Is that a problem? No, it's no problem. I just need the age of the youngest driver. That's an insurance requirement. Oh well, I'm twenty eight and my husband's twenty nine. My younger brother will be helping us. He's eighteen. Oh well, unfortunately, he won't be able to drive the truck as you need to be at least twenty one years of age. Oh, I see. Well, put my age down then. Sure. Just one more question. It's another insurance requirement. Do you and your husband both have Australian drivers' licenses? Well, we're originally from the U.S., but we both have licenses from here in Australia. Great. Well, that's all I need from you for now. So I'll be in touch to confirm your booking. Thank you, Gary. That is the end of part one. You now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to listening part two. Part two. You are going to hear a speech given by a man to a group of students who are going to help at an arts festival. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Thank you, everyone, for agreeing to help us out at the upcoming Greenfield City Arts Festival, where we'll have lots of wonderful performances and talks from artists, dancers, writers, and musicians. The purpose of today's meeting is to give you some information you'll need before the festival starts next week. I'd like to start with some background to the festival. As you may already know, it has a very long history. It's not quite as old as the Blacktown Arts Festival, but still, after twenty years, we have a very good reputation both here and overseas. In fact, we were the first festival to invite artists from other countries to speak to our audiences. This is common practice now at festivals, but it started here. We are also based in one of the most beautiful parts of the city, with sweeping views to the Bay Area and the old University buildings. Our aim for the festival this year is a little different from other years. Previously, we've always donated the profits from the festival to a local project, such as building a new playground or renovating the city hall. And we've always been lucky enough to have lots of visitors who are here on their holidays and have plenty of money to spend in our city. Next week's festival, however, is more about the people who actually live here. We want to give them an enjoyable few days in their own city.
we need more volunteers than usual this year to help us out with the increased numbers of visitors we're hoping to get, especially at the information points. This is where we'll be placing more of you this year. Last year, some sections of the festival were very quiet. The children's art and craft areas, for example, didn't attract the numbers we were expecting, which was disappointing, although the children's concerts all seemed to be well attended. Now, what is it you'll be doing exactly? Well, for most of you, you'll come into the volunteer office at the start of each day to find out where we need you to work that day. The administration staff will have a list of names and duties and will show you on the festival map where you need to go. Often it will be to the place where a show is about to start and you'll assist with the flow of people in and out of the venue, checking that all tickets are valid. It's important today that we get your volunteer card processed as you will need that for identification throughout the festival. We have the cards already printed with the photograph that you gave us with your application form, but they do need a signature. So don't forget to do that before you leave today. If you show your volunteer card at any cafe within the festival zone, then it'll entitle you to a 20% discount on the cost of your lunch, so they're well worth having. Before you hear the rest of the recording, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 16 to 20. Can all of you see a copy of the map of the festival site? I want to point out several places that visitors often ask about so you can help them. We often get asked where the toilets are, of course. Well, if we look at the map of the old part of our city where the festival is held, most people will be coming in on foot through the city arch, which is at the bottom of the map on Mountain Road. From here you will need to tell them to walk past the children's play area and on towards the cinema. The public toilets are behind the cinema on the side of the police station, not the library. We're expecting hot weather next week, so people will want to know where the water fountains are. Again, from the archway on Mountain Road, tell people to go towards the tennis courts. The water fountain is shown by that circular shape and it's well shaded from the big trees in that area. We expect the information tent to be busy, so we've tried to put it in a very visible spot. If you look to the east of the children's play area, you'll see an unusual C-shaped building and the information tent is just in front of that. In previous years, we've put it closer to the tennis courts, but it can get a little crowded there. Not everyone will have pre-booked their tickets, so they'll need to buy them on the day from the ticket office. In this case, from the archway, point them in the direction of the theatre. It's a beautiful octagon-shaped building, and the ticket office is on the east side of it, not the west. Hopefully everyone will be hungry and ready to buy lunch and snacks from the food stalls. If visitors can't find them, tell them to head towards the tennis courts and they'll find them just to the north. They'll have a nice view of the lake as they eat. That is the end of part two. You now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to listening part three. Part three. You are going to hear two students 
discussing an assignment topic about environmental sustainability. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. Hi, Tanya. Hi, Greg. Are you ready to work on the assignment? Sure am. Can we go over the task again first? We need to describe how the university is improving its environmental sustainability. Right. So, what have you found? Well, the university is installing new solar panels around the campus. Are they going to take up much green space? No, they're going to use rooftop space, so we won't even see them. Mm, that's a good idea. It must cost a lot. Yes, £7.75 million, apparently. That's the main drawback with solar. It's the large initial investment that's needed. Yes, but fortunately the government is contributing some of the funding. So, how does this programme make the university more environmentally friendly? Well, I guess because the electricity comes from the sun, not from coal-fired power stations. And I suppose the cost of power goes down too? Yes, the university can save some money that way. I think the real advantage is that it allows the university to collect some interesting data on renewables like solar power. Yes, you're right. So, what else have we got? Well, I found out about a new building that is being constructed on campus, the Global Change Institute. The one next to the library? It's going up quickly, isn't it? Yes, the foundations are in already. There's a picture of what it will eventually look like on the university website. It looks beautiful. And all the materials will be environmentally friendly, no rainforest timbers. Great! Yeah, I'm not sure how functional it will be, though. What do you mean? Think about the people who use the building. The architects haven't considered them. The design incorporates a lot of natural light, which will save energy, but it will make the building very hot in summer. I don't know. I like it. I mean, for one thing, there'll be a collaborative learning centre, which will be great for students. And more importantly, the beauty of this building is that it's going to house an institute that researches environmental issues like climate change. And the design of the building reflects that. Yeah, I guess so. But look at where they're constructing it. There used to be a garden there. I know. We need to consider the amount of green space on campus. But I think this building is worth it. Fair enough. What other initiatives should we discuss? How about the bottle refill stations? Do you mean those places where you can refill your water bottle? Yes. The university is installing them across the campus. So, how do they help the environment? I thought the university was trying to save water. Well, yes, but we all need to drink water. The main benefit is reducing the amount of rubbish that goes into landfill. Apparently, empty plastic water bottles end up there in huge numbers. But what about recycling? Well, unfortunately, according to the statistics, only about 35% of them get recycled. OK, I can see the reasoning behind them, but have you actually used one of those stations? Yeah, I have. Now that there are more of them around, you don't have to wait in line to use them. Have you? Well, I used one once, but I was very disappointed. Why? I think they're great. You get clean, pure water to drink for free. What's not to like? Well, I like my water icy cold, and the water from the refill station isn't. <laughs> Greg, think about all the energy that refrigeration uses. Yeah, you're right, I suppose. Now, we need one more example for our assignment. I thought we could mention the Green Office initiative. Yes, they have been advertising it around the campus a lot recently. University staff are being encouraged to appoint representatives who will coordinate things like recycling in the office. That's good, but I think these representatives should go even further and not only target offices, but also laboratories. 
How environmentally friendly are practices there? Hmm, there's no mention of that in the policy. You're right, there's no point in having it if it's too limited in scope. Before you hear the rest of the recording, you have some time to look at questions 28 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 28 to 30. Now, we should include a summary of the progress of the sustainability programme, don't you think? Yes, let's go through it step by step. It all started with the decision by the university management to do something about sustainability. They needed some broad goals, so they formed a steering committee to come up with a plan. Now, I know one of the first obvious changes they made was to revise the design guidelines for any new buildings to be constructed on campus. That's right. The student body is expanding, so they couldn't afford to delay on that. What they needed next was someone who could take responsibility for implementing all these policy changes. So they appointed an energy manager for the first time. Not a professor, but an administrator. Hmm. It wasn't just administrative reform, though, was it? I mean, the university also made changes in the areas of research and learning, too. Look at the institute that they formed. That's true. There was a worldwide search for scholars to work there. They're now doing research that will make a positive difference. That is the end of part three. You now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to listening part four. Part four. You are going to hear a part of a lecture given to marine biology students about a small fish that lives in the Australian desert. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. So let's talk now about an unusual type of fish that lives here in Australia, the goby fish. It's a colourful fish that grows to only about six centimetres in length. And while you might think that all fish are skilled at swimming through water with ease, goby fish can't do so easily. So how do they manage to move around? Well, goby fish will in fact travel hundreds of kilometres using the fast-moving water during a flood to travel more quickly. Scientists know this because they've tracked the DNA of goby fish in different locations and found connections between them. So why are we talking about this fish today? Well, it's an amazing little fish if we consider its habitat. It lives in the very dry desert interior of central Australia, in rivers and springs that come and go, depending on rainfall. It can even be seen in the little puddles that are left behind when the rivers and springs dry up. 
goby fish are able to wait in the shallow water long enough to leapfrog their way across the landscape when the wet weather returns, which is an ingenious way of travelling around. This makes them quite different to other species of desert fish, which often show more isolated population patterns. Amazingly, these little fish can live quite happily in extreme environmental conditions. The waters the fish inhabit sometimes contain three times as much salt as seawater, and the temperature of the water ranges from between 5 and 40 degrees. Despite these hardships, the benefits for this hardy little fish of moving to new water sources when the opportunity arises are that there is less risk of overcrowding and, as a consequence, there is more food to share around. When it comes to reproduction and mating behaviour in the spring and summertime, it is the male goby who must attract the female. After clearing an area where eggs are to be deposited, the male goby performs a flashy little dance. Once attracted, the female follows the male back to his nest, which is often under rocks on the riverbed. Once there, she will lay her eggs. Unlike most other species, it is in fact the male who looks after the eggs. He fans them with his pectoral fins, which helps to keep up a supply of oxygen to the eggs. The threats to goby fish are many. Of course, there will always be natural predation, such as when birds make a snack out of goby fish they spot in shallow water. But like so many natural environments around the world, the areas that goby fish live in are being altered by human activity, which poses a threat to the tiny fish. Water is a precious resource in central Australia, and the use of bores that drill down to bring up underground water is causing the level of the water table to fall, and some springs are even disappearing altogether. Furthermore, freshwater sources are obviously important for livestock, but cattle often harm the easily damaged margins of the springs. Some good news is that a few springs containing desert goby have been fenced off and some have recently been acquired as National Park. Recent research into goby fish has come up with some surprises. It is commonly believed that the large dominant males of a species are the ones who go on to breed with the females. But it has been observed that smaller goby fish pretend to be highly aggressive and attack quickly when threatened. This causes their opponent to retreat and so a fight is avoided. This intimidation strategy increases the smaller male's breeding chances as the larger male is scared off before they can assess the real risk posed by the smaller fish. This opens up the possibility that this may also be the case for other animal species. Already, scientists have found a jumping spider that uses the goby-like bluffing to hold their ground against larger males, and it is expected that other animal species will do the same. That is the end of part four. You now have some time to check your answers.